This is the G Podcast with your host, Tommy B. Hey, what's up, y'all? Welcome to episode 221 of This is the G Podcast. Yes, yes, yes. What's up? I'm Tommy B. And each week we do news, politics, pop culture, and that piping hot tea from the one and only Tanya B. Syracuse Mike has your news update. The newsmaker crew is here. That's me and political analyst and author, Harold Michael Harvey. The first president in American history faces felony charges. We will talk about it. Harold Michael Harvey will break it down. But first, let's get into news with Syracuse Mike. News team, assemble! It's time for the Week in News with Syracuse Mike. It's never happened before. The first U.S. president to ever face criminal charges was present for the first day of jury selection Monday in New York. Before things got started, Donald Trump told reporters outside the courtroom, This is political persecution. This is a persecution like never before. Nobody's ever seen anything like it. And again, it's a case that should have never been brought. It's an assault on America. Over half of the first batch of 96 potential jurors have already been sent home. Many indicated they couldn't be fair and impartial in the case. This is the Stormy Daniels hush money case. After a slow start, jury selection gained super speed Tuesday as seven were seated in Donald Trump's New York hush money trial. The judge also warned the presumptive Republican presidential nominee about potential jury intimidation. Mr. Trump was heard mouthing some words and gesturing during the questioning of a potential juror. With seven jurors now seated, he also complained that the judge was rushing the trial. Trump faces 34 felony counts of falsifying business records to cover up a hush money payment to adult film star Stormy Daniels before the election in 2016. Before it really started, it was over. Madam President, Majority leaders I move to adjourn the impeachment trial of Alejandro N. Mayorkas. The impeachment of Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas never got far in the Senate. Tuesday, articles of impeachment were delivered to the Senate by the House. The impeachment of the first cabinet member in nearly 150 years was tied to his handling of the migrant issue at the southern border. Quickly dismissing the two articles Wednesday in the Democratic-led Senate prompted harsh criticism from Republican Minority Leader Mitch McConnell. No evidence, no procedure. This is a day that's not a proud day in the history of the Senate. McConnell said by doing what they did, the Senate, in effect, ignored the directions of the House, which were to have a trial. Atlanta Mayor Andre Dickens said during a press conference Wednesday that protesters opposed to the new public safety training center have caused more than $10 million worth of damages so far. Many of the attacks have been on construction companies associated with building the training center, also known as Cop City by opponents. In sports, the NBA has permanently banned Toronto Raptors forward John Tay Porter for gambling violations. Members of the Kennedy family joined President Biden in Philadelphia to offer a pointed endorsement of the current occupant of the White House. President Biden has been a champion for all the rights and freedoms that my father and uncle stood for. That's why nearly every single grandchild of Joe and Rose Kennedy supports Joe Biden. A large number of Kennedy family members have been very vocal in backing Mr. Biden and not Robert F. Kennedy Jr. RFK is running as an independent and there is growing concern inside the family and among Democratic Party leaders that Kennedy could take votes away from Biden, leading to a second Trump administration. This weekend marks the 25th anniversary of the massacre at Columbine High School in Colorado. Twelve students and one teacher were killed. It wasn't the first mass shooting at a school in the U.S., and sadly, it would not be the last. A vigil for the victims takes place on the steps of Colorado's capital. Because of cable news and the Internet, Columbine became one of the biggest news stories of the 1990s. Monday is the last day to register to vote for the local May primary. Early voting begins on April 29th. Thanks, Mike, for the headlines, man. uh, Political analyst Harold Michael Harvey is here. The fellas are out this week. Man, uh, Harold Michael Harvey, known for several books, uh, Freaknik Lawyer, which I say should have been included in the documentary, man. You were, (laughs) they did you wrong. (laughs) That's all I (laughs) Yeah. And uh, my CT Vivian story, Watch Night and Justice in the Round. Uh, All great books. All great, great books. We can still get them at uh, HaroldMichaelHarvey.com, correct? Correct, yes. They're all available there. Okay. There you go. And and 
Any of these books relate to the current circumstances we're dealing with? Yeah, I think Carol, I, I think today we're going to be talking about the uh, beginning of the Trump trial. And so just as in the round, the subtitle is Essays on the American Jury System. And although I wrote this book um, to, to try to explain to lay people uh, what had happened uh, as a result of that first Trayvon, as a result of the Trayvon Martin trial, and as a result of the first um, uh, loud music trial where the, uh, the you know, defendant sort of got off before he was retried. Mm-hmm. Um, I, so I wrote this book um, to sort of explain to lay people what happens in the jury process. And the salient point that I would like for people to take away from this book is that if you get a jury summons, show up. Yeah. And that if you show up, don't show up with excuses or with, with some scheme to try to get out of jury duty because, um, you know, so, so, sometimes uh, criminal defendants and whose skin color is uh, not the lightest of you uh, are actually innocent. And if yeah. you have people who are willing to sit there and listen to the evidence and make the state or the government prove uh, all the essential elements of the crime, uh, you know, they'll go down the road uh, for something that they didn't do. So, and and vice versa. Sometimes um, I I know from my past experience as a criminal defense trial lawyer is that um, certain members of our society just, they vote race just like certain people in our society vote party, no matter mm-hmm. what the circumstances are. So, um, you get a summons, you want to go. And you want yeah. to go with the attitude that you're going to be fair and you're going to listen to the evidence and um, and you render a decision that's fair to all parties uh, concerned. OK. And, and you know, that leads us to another first for Donald Trump. Um, he becomes the first American president to face a criminal trial. And that's one of the reasons I asked you to come on today. Um, as we take this episode, we're a few days away from another uh, I call it a day that will live in infamy for Donald Trump uh, for about four days a week for the next six weeks. Um, a jury will decide whether or not he becomes an, a convicted felon. And you know what? This moved a lot faster than I expected. I really expected six weeks to find a jur- jury. And here we are with, with seven men, five women. They have the alternate. I am shocked that as we talk today, this trial will have opening arguments in just a few days. So, Mr. Harvey, how does this trial fit into the larger scheme of legal challenges faced by Trump? And I say that because there's so much going on with him. I think it, it, we it, it's almost like a tornado or a, a, an earthquake. <laughs> you know, you have to give it a Richter scale or an EF number. So where does it stand? Well, it's at least a five on the Richter scale. I mean, this is a very serious charge. He's facing um, felony charges uh, that could send him to jail for, you know, a number of years. Um, Mm. And, uh, of course, convicted felons also, whether he gets jail time or not, are precluded from doing certain things uh, in our political system. For instance, uh, running for public office and also voting. Uh, in uh, in election. So this is a very uh, serious case. Uh, I think all of the cases are serious. So, I mean, I would not rate one above the other one. This just happens to be the one that made its way down the pipe and is ready for trial before the uh, other ones. That, that You know, there's just a midriff of um, problems and stumbling blocks um, that the um, two cases... Uh, that Jack Smith is prosecuting uh, ran into, and then you know the case that Fonnie Willis ran in uh, is prosecuting here in the state of Georgia. So mm-hmm. um, you know, District Attorney Bragg uh, has gotten his case to trial, uh, got his case uh, to uh, boy dear uh, over a hundred, um, several hundred people to come up with a, a jury of twelve and six alternates. So it, surprised that it happened so quick, it just shows you. What happens when you get a you have a judge who um, who is on top of his game and um, you know sets the tone for 
we're not going to let this drag out. And here's what we're going to do. If you came in here with some pre notion and you don't want to be here, well, I don't want you here because you're the least likely person we want as a jury. So you can be excused. All mm. right. Now, all serious people remain. And we're going to ask you these questions and the lawyer is going to figure out which one of you they want to keep around. And so it's a speedy trial. That's how we got to um, a jury uh, in less than four, in four days. Yeah. Amazing. And, and, you know, when you look at it, uh, because the, this has been going on for a few years, uh, for, for, for multiple years, um, the evidence that's being presented, uh, what do you see? How do you think this is going to have an impact on the trial? Uh, well, you know, there, there's a little difference in this case than, uh, you know, it, it's commonly called a hush money trial. That was the former district attorney's case that he would have uh, uh, indicted, or maybe he did indict it, and, and when Bragg came in, he elected not to prosecute that case. So Bragg went back to the drawing board and investigated the case all over again, and he found a felony. So in addition to having uh, charged uh, Trump with the misdemeanor of having um, um, given hush money to uh, keep this affair away from the uh, voting electorate, um, he discovered a violation of campaign, federal campaign um, financial law, which mm -hmm. is a felony, which gets us to the felony charge that Trump is after. Now, the key thing about this evidence is uh, probably testimony and documentary evidence that will come into um, the trial via uh, Trump's former lawyer, uh, uh, Cohen and Cohen, uh, from what I gather from pre-trial discussions, is uh, that um, he was directed by Trump specifically to pay this money, um, and um, of course, the Trump's defense is is that uh, Cohen was paid attorney fees, that the money that Trump uh, paid to uh, Cohen was for legal work that he had performed on behalf of Mr. Trump or one of his um, corporation. Mm -hmm. uh, Cohen says no, he was specifically instructed to negotiate a deal with um, with the tabloid to kill that story. And uh, well, let me ask you: Do you think uh, the legal issues of Cohen will impact, or will they use his credibility? Uh, try to attack his credibility. They would definitely uh, attempt to uh, attack his credibility. Every witness's uh, credibility comes under scrutiny. But because he's been in jail. And, and not just that he's been in jail, but he was convicted of lying. Yeah, yeah. Now, now, now the big question about that is, and he's going to tell this particular jury, is that mm -hmm. he lied to protect Donald Trump. He lied to protect the secrets that Donald Trump didn't want the public to know. So he is a convicted liar. Why? Because he lied to protect his boss, who is now on trial. You know, so so yes, the, the defense is going to bring out the conviction, going to bring out the fact that he lied under oath, uh, and um, the state's uh, counter to that is, well, why did you lie? Well, I lied to protect this defendant here. Uh, because I was loyal to Mr. Trump, I lied to protect him so that his reputation wouldn't be ruined and he would have an opportunity to possibly be elected president of the United States. And the lie did work because um, the the uh, scheme to pay this woman off, you know, occurred at the time when um, Trump's uh, um, campaign was in a tailspin over uh, this uh, allegation that uh, uh that he uh, believed that you could do anything to that women would allow you to do anything to them, including mm -hmm. walking up to them and you know grabbing them by the crowd. So um, you know, so so that's what this case boils down to is the not only the testimony of Coin, but the district attorney Bragg has documents, legal documents yeah. that establishes the testimony that coin is going to give. So I think that's going to sort of like smooth out and even out the problems with having to bring a witness in the court 
who has been convicted of uh, who's a convicted liar. Well, in our in our lifetime, any other politician would have been long gone out of the race. Uh, and, and we're looking at, you know, a trial of a former president, first time in history, facing the potential of being con- a convicted felon. Um, how do you think, be- because we're hearing, you know, just like what you said, the Cohen testimony, the Stormy Daniels testimony, what's uh, Mac- uh, Mac- 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 McDougal? <laughs> uh, I- I- I'm saying her name wrong. You know, all this testimony, how do you, how do you think it, it, it's going to weigh on the polls when it comes down to reelection for him? You know, because again, and, and I don't just say this, uh, I, I don't say this in humor, but it, it's almost like the fact that the fact that Trump said when he came down that escalator or before that, that I could shoot somebody in the middle of Park Avenue or wherever in New York and walk away from it, it's almost becoming true. Yeah, well, actually what he said was he could shoot somebody uh, on Fifth Avenue and he wouldn't lose any votes. Right. And he wouldn't lose lose any votes. Mm -hmm. And so that's the situation we're in. So now you've got these salacious allegations that he was involved in an extramarital affair with a porn store and a um, playboy playmate uh, during the course of his marriage and that even one of these uh, escapades or affairs took place when his wife was laid up just having had uh, a baby. Uh, So these are very salacious uh, allegations. And I think the the fact that we are now closer to uh, November, to the election date, Hmm. people are beginning to now take... um, to make a to, to pay attention uh, to the race and to the issues, so I, I think when during the course of the trial, when these salacious details come out about his relationship with Stormy Daniels and Karen McDougal, um, I, I, I think his um, political persona will take a hit. Because we saw we saw what happened. With Chappaquiddick, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? We saw what happened with Gary Hart. You know what I mean? The list is long. The only person I think who, who's who's gotten away partially was Trump. I mean, no, it's, uh, was Clinton, you know? Uh, but but it's, it, it is a bit amazing when you check the polls. And as this thing goes on, he, he he's increasing. You, you know, and, and Clinton, if you look at that situation, I believe Clinton got away with it because his wife stood by him. Yeah. Uh, we we don't see that same um, support coming from uh, Melania Trump. Okay. Um, you know, and I understand that she's she's hosting a fundraiser this weekend someplace, and he's hosting a fundraiser somewhere else. So it's the dueling fundraiser by the wife and husband and wife team. But uh, you don't see that public support. Uh, I think it angered, I, I have heard reports that it angered her. And so she's sort of um, been a little sullen and, and uh, standoffish about it. But Hillary Clinton uh, immediately stood behind Bill, and that was sort of like the end of the, the discussion. Now, you know, where these other um, politicians took hits, you know, Trump is just unusual um, because. He is a former president. He's a powerful man. Mm-hmm. He yeah. knows people in powerful positions, and um, you, you know, I'm I'm still not certain that he will not find a way to wiggle his way out of the problems that he's having, out of the legal problems and cases that he's involved. In. Well, let me ask you. With that, with that said, you know, the defense of delay, delay, delay. That that's gone. For that situation. In this case, yes. So, what do you think the next uh, strategy is going to be for for his defense? Well, well, he's stuck. He's he's got to sit there and he's got to listen to the state put up their evidence, uh, and his uh, attorney's got to come back and try to uh, counter uh, that with some reasonable explanation 
Yeah, for for um, the former president's conduct. I'll tell you, I watched uh, the uh, at the end of the day um, on Friday. Okay, and they had just finished. I forgot what they call when they're going through the list of uh, the defendants' past issues. They went through the whole list, and he came out. W- 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 say that again. The Sandoval hearing. Yes. He was not a happy man. <laughs> he was, when he came out and addressed the press, he was pissed. And, and one of the, uh, one of the, uh, pundits, you know, one of the surrogates, uh, on, on, I think it may have been MSNBC said she had never seen him as shaken. He was shaken by it. So uh, what are your thoughts on that? Well, you, you know, saying of all here, and it's not something we have here in Georgia, but, uh, in, in New York, you have this process where, um, where the defendant uh, has an opportunity to learn um, how the state will attempt to impeach his character should the defendant decide to take the witness stand and testify. Okay, so like in Georgia, I mean, you make that decision based upon your own uh, knowledge of what issues uh, in the past have confronted your client. Yeah. Uh, But in New York, the state has to get there and they have to tell you if he should take the stand, we want to go into this bad act. And of course, the court then has a balancing test and has to determine whether or not it will allow the state to go into that. Yeah. And so that's what took place Friday afternoon is uh, he sat there and he heard all of the bad things about him that the state would introduce if he took the witness stand. Now, while he has gone out before the press and said he was that he was going to testify in this trial, I think that's just bluster like most of the stuff that he does. He's just talking and and there is really no serious inclination. But in order for his uh, counsel to adequately represent him, they've got to go through that hearing because something may happen during the course of this trial when you get down to the end of it. The only person that can pull Donald Trump through would be Donald Trump getting on the witness stand and testifying. And yeah. he would hate to be put in that situation and not know what the uh, what the state was going to come after him with. So, um, you know, it, it, I think it gave him an eye opener. He's not accustomed to people uh, saying bad things about him. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. So he was forced to sit in the room and to listen uh, yeah. to all the things that uh, the public uh, in some aspect or another thinks is, is wrong with his character and his personality. Yeah, and I think that's going to be the big difference because him sitting in court every day having to deal with that uh, is going to be the difference in everything that's going on. It, it's just like, and I, you know, you know me, I'm a movie guy. It's the untouchables. <laughs> you know what I mean? It, it's Capone who who the least, the thing he least expected tripped him up, sent him to prison. You know, and I think, you know, I, I think we'll find out probably within the next six weeks what that thing's going to be. So we'll see. What, what's your final take, man? There are a lot of people who are saying, yeah, I don't care about this. I'm not going to, you know, I, I, whatever happens, happens. Um, but but I, I'm not going to watch it. I don't care about it. What do you, what do you say to folks? Oh, this is a very, very important um, point in American history. You know, so, I mean, it, it's, a, it's a court battle, but it has some significance to um, where we are as a country, you know, because um, independent voters uh, are going to take an assessment of what takes place in the next few weeks to make up their mind, to help them to make up their mind, at least, in terms of who they will support in November for the presidency of this country. And, um, uh, you know, it, 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 it's a, it, is a, it is this simple. What November comes down to is that if Trump wins in America, you have placed uh, two leaders, two dictatorial leaders in charge of the world, Trump and Putin. And that could be bad, bad, bad for the entire Western world. Yeah, good point. So this is this is a very uh, crucial point in American history. I don't know if, if Attorney, uh, District Attorney Bragg can carry um, the day or not. Uh, but um, 
If he can, it will have a significant impact uh, on what happens in November. Uh, but then, you know, Trump is a cagey in fighter. And um, if there is a way to weasel out of uh, a conviction, uh, Donald Trump is a person who can find that way to do it. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, I, I'll say, I mean, my only take is for the week is, you know, we have a former president who's running for reelection facing a criminal trial. Mm-hmm. You know, think about that. I mean, that's the thing you have to think about. And, and, and regardless, I mean, you hear it's interesting you hear people. I mean, you know, some of the pundits like or, or sports personalities, uh, commentators like uh, Stephen A. on Hannity saying uh, black people relate to Trump because of his legal issues. And, and you know, that, you know, it's offensive because, you know, we know the difference. You know, we know the difference between a Trump and you know, and, and, and other issues that impact people. And, and you said an interesting thing about people who think that way. Uh, what, let me, what, what's your thought on that? Well, you know, um, let's take a look at it. Um, Stephen A is a, is a middle-class American Negro. And mm-hmm. when Stephen A says it, and when Donald Trump says it, what they're basically are saying is that um, the black community has a cult- culture of criminality. That is far from from the truth. You know, uh, many people in, in my uh, community and in communities I'm sure that you were raised and grew up in uh, don't have any such uh, history of criminality. And so, um, but there is a segment of, of our society who do that forgotten uh, black American <laughs> that is uh, living below the middle class standards, and um, you know, so there's a there, there there is a certain thing called there's classism in mm-hmm. the black community. Yes, and lower, lower income blacks who run um, who 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 come in uh, contact with the law more frequently uh, because it's easy for law enforcement to. Um, to get them and nab them for crimes, um, can sort of identify with him. And if you look at the people who they were able to get into that Chick Fil A uh, in Atlanta, I mean, they were um, they were not middle class American Negroes. Hmm. Uh, they fell be- below that middle class standard, and they do identify with him because they are persecuted. And so when he tells the American public that he's been persecuted for these crimes, uh, for these charges, which is untrue. He's being prosecuted. <laughs> he's been prosecuted. Yeah, yeah, he's been prosecuted, not being persecuted. <laughs> you, you, you know, there's a certain that that uh, forgotten American Negro yeah. uh, can identify with that because they've been left out of, of the system. And yeah. if there's any place in the black community where uh, Donald Trump is beating Joe Biden. It's among uh, the lower economic rungs in the uh, black community. But it's no different than what you're seeing on the mainstream side as well. Would you Would you agree or disagree on the white side? Uh, uh, it's the same, you know. So so you get uh, the forgotten, the forgotten uh, lower rung uh, white American is uh, the rabbit mega uh, supporter, and and that's why they're there. And because he he does speak to uh, at least his rhetoric sort of sounds his like rhetoric that. does yeah well, but his policy <laughs> but his, his rhetoric you know appears yeah. for those people on the bottom rung so you get poor white people who rally to him and you get poor black people who rally to him and saying oh he's speaking he's talking about me because that's the way I feel that the system um, uh, has persecuted me. And uh, to a large extent, they're right. They have been persecuted. And somehow in America, once uh, we can save democracy, we've got to figure out a way to bring all Americans into the American dream. Yeah, good point. Good point. On that note, got to thank the one and only Harold Michael Harvey, political analyst, author. Thank you so much for taking the time today. And and two essays you've got out there. Uh, one addresses the freak Nick. Uh, situation uh, will you not being included in the documentary and the other uh, you address the Fulton County the, well not the Fulton County but the uh, Young Thug 
uh, case happening in Fulton County. Quickly, uh, tell people how they can read that. Give a quick summary in a minute of both and, and just let them know where they can find it. You can find them at haroldmichaelharvey.com. Please go to haroldmichaelharvey.com. You can pull up uh, both of my recent essays. And there's a subscribe button at haroldmichaelharvey.com. If you will uh, put your information in the subscribe button and subscribe to uh, to my newsletter, you, you'll you get, every time I post something, uh, they'll send you a notification in the inbox. You can pull it up and read it. And, and uh, quite simply, uh, quickly, the, the piece on the Young Thug trial is I've come to the conclusion after uh, watching the trial for several months now is that um, the trial management of uh, Judge Euro Glanville is just, it, it leaves something to be desired. And he uh, has yelled at um, both defense, uh, at the defense counsel and also at the prosecuting attorneys, uh, basically because he's he has mismanaged his time and mismanaged the trial. He's got uh, jurors sitting around um, all day sometime and all they get to do is stay in the jury room while um, the lawyers fight over whether or not a piece of evidence can come into the trial. So he's issued this administrative order to try to streamline things and then he says that if you don't present to the other side evidence within this time frame, uh, then I'm not going to allow the evidence to come in. And of course, uh, by withholding evidence, I mean, I think it sort of um, violates the constitutional rights of uh, the state who's out there to protect the interests of all of us. Mm-hmm. And also it potentially violates the right of the criminally accused to be able to, um, you, you know, have the evidence that they need at their disposal in order to prove their uh, their innocence or to yeah. get the state from establishing beyond a reasonable doubt that they're guilty. So I, I sort of... Um, go through the temper tangents of uh, Judge Glanville and I conclude that he's basically setting uh, this trial up to be won on appeal. Yeah. Um, wow. Emotional maturity. And of course, way back at the turn of the century or just before the turn of the century, mm-hmm. I engaged in a conversation with him about um having gone through a stress test and how he did that in order to understand, in order to increase his level of tolerance and endurance without having to blow a stack uh, on the bench. And he was a new judge at this point in time. And mm, yeah. I suggest that maybe it may be time to revisit the results of that uh, stress test. I'm going to go another one because it, it's not, you know, 25 years later, it's not working. Wow. And then, of course, um, I, I feel offended. I feel abused that Hulu uh, has uh, rid me out of history. You know, I performed um, an invaluable service to the um, Atlanta City judicial system and to um, uh, historically black college and university students uh, during the uh, late, uh, mid to late 1990s uh, in providing pro bono legal representation to students who were arrested during uh, Freaknik. And of course, you know, this is the third weekend in April and Freaknik uh, was traditionally held the third weekend in April. And so in 1995, this time of day, I was down at the jail trying to get um, students out of jail and back to school by Monday so they could be in class by Monday. Mm. And, um, I, you know, from my own estimation, it was yeoman service. I got probably about four or five hours of sleep in 72 hours, uh, had no help, although a number of people had signed the sheet to say that they would volunteer to uh, provide free services to these students. Um, you know, no one showed up to help me until um, Monday morning, and they all wanted to, um, to to bask in the glory of all the hard work that I had done over the, over the weekend. Yeah. Uh, and so then you, you have Hulu, uh, comes out with a documentary, and while they talk about uh, the disturbances and students were being arrested, and some believe they were unfairly arrested, they don't talk about a black lawyer who didn't charge a student a penny in in order to uh, uh, to get them out of jail. I mean, one of the first things that we could do for them, we couldn't get them a bond right away. But, right. but we thought that the most important thing to do, and when I say we, 
I worked after I established the fact that Gate City Bar Association was sponsored uh, pro bono attorneys. I uh, partnered with the Southern Christian Leadership Conference and with Ozell Sutton, who who was the community relations director, Southeastern community relations director for the, for the United States Justice Department. And um, and and uh, so we decided that the best that we could do initially was to make sure that when those kids who were arrested for the first time in their life, 17, mm-hmm. 18, 19 years old, that they saw a friendly face. And so I spent uh, the night, Friday night, you know, from five or six o'clock, I spent that uh, until 3.30, I spent in, 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 in the jail uh, talking to everybody who had been arrested, making sure that they understood that there was somebody on the outside trying to get them out of there as soon as possible. Well, let, let me tell you, there's a, there, the thoughts of a part two, what I'm hearing. They're trying to get a part two. Uh, we need a petition, <laughs> do whatever we need to do. Talk to the folks at Hulu about getting that included, without a doubt, without a doubt. That story needs to be told. And, uh, yeah, it does. Uh, you know, it's a very important uh, part of the process. Yeah. Uh, of, course, of course, I took a professional hit um, as a result of uh, standing up for people I didn't know. Yeah. But then, you know, when you take the oath, that's what you take the oath to do. Good stuff. On that note, God, again, thank you, Carol Michael Harvey, for all you do, man. Thank you for coming on again today. Y'all, we'd love your thoughts, your feedback. Go to castropolis.net, choose the people poll, uh, leave us a voice message. Love to hear from you. And again, go to haroldmichaelharvey.com. Both those essays um, are on the site, along with the uh, opportunity to get those books. Mr. Harvey, thank you again. Thank you again. Appreciate you coming on. Thank you so much. Take care. All right, man. All right. Well, we'll take a break and uh, we'll do Tanya B with the T right after the break. Thank you again. Free Palestine. More. This is the G podcast after the break. Hey, this is Tommy B from This is the G Podcast. I want to encourage all my G's who reside in the area of Jonesboro, Stockbridge, Covington, Conyers, South Gwinnett. That's the new Georgia Congressional District 13 to vote for Karen Renee for Congress. Karen Renee is a true advocate for her constituents and truly believes in empowering the people. Visit electkarenrenee.com for more information and also find out whether you're in the new District 13. Follow her campaign on Facebook at Elect Karen Renee. Let's support a candidate who truly represents the people. Now then, children, it's time for tea. It's tea time, y'all. Sipping the tea with Tanya B. Yes, children, it is tea time with the girl Tanya B right here on This Is The G Podcast. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and share. Each and every day we bring it to you. A good bowl of gumbo, pop culture, entertainment, sports, politics, you name it, we got it. And don't forget to check out the G Podcast YouTube channel. All right, here we go, y'all. It's your girl, Tanya B, coming to you from somewhere in America. First, we've got to say rest in peace to former American Idol finalist, Mendisa Hunley. She lost her life at 47 years young. A couple of days ago, she was found deceased in her Tennessee home. Now, back in uh, 2014, she actually won a Grammy for her album, Overcomer, in the category of Contemporary Christian Music Album. She had struggled with anxiety and depression in her weight. She'd gotten gastric bypass. She gained over 100 pounds. Don't know what the cause of death is, but her voice was powerful and it will be missed we will also miss the voice of one author Pooch Tavares of the legendary Boston R&B group Tavares you know more than a woman don't take away the music heaven must be missing an angel check it out she's gone who done it all of that well he left the group after a massive stroke a couple of years ago but then he also lost his battle with ALS Now, last year, his brother Ralph passed away and Chubby Tavares, the other co-lead singer of songs like Heaven Must Be Missing an Angel and things along that line, he retired from performing due to his health issues. So we only have Tiny Tavares and Pooch Tavares remaining. I hope the brother Victor will rejoin the group and don't take away the music because baby Tavares had hits on hits on hits. Ashanti was pregnant. We knew it every, the moment I knew it, the moment everybody said, oh, her mama denying it. She's pregnant. She and Nelly are engaged. Wish them all the best. Nelly got to keep a gig now. He's going to go on the road with Janet Jackson as her opening act. Shout out to 50 Cent. As intelligent as he can be cuckoo for Cocoa Puff sometime, he bought his business now. He just opened up G-Unit Studios in Shreveport, Louisiana. Not too far from uh, New Orleans, but after Tyler Perry, he is the second largest black-owned film studio in the world. I couldn't even get it out. All right, 50 Cent, five on it to you. 
Okay, in the We Tidy All category. Again this week, Neo go back in the corner. Apparently he seems to think bigamy is okay. So move to Utah. Um, put out a hit record because the one you put out last week is not going to pay that child support for them six kids and four baby mamas you got. So just Neo be quiet. Also, Dumb Donkey of the Week, Ryan McKnight further confirmed he ain't nothing but straight trash yes i said it that's my opinion but he's calling his kitchen his first marriage a product of sin well who committed the sin you sinner <laughs> okay he got the lady pregnant and he married her now his first two sons ain't checking for him anymore and i think they're more talented than him truth be told he's calling them evil beings no brian you're the evil being go get a hit record because you can't sell a record to save your soul and you are just a first class a-hole yes i made it Ryan. i'm sick of you and stay off social media go get some therapy well i guess you know king charles that expensive experiment down at cnn has gone bust the show has been canceled they had to pay gil king got 12 million dollars so now she can get some more weight loss shots and girl please go to the new wig king charles broccoli go sit down anyway that's all i got to say about the two of them oh good god good god oh mariah carey she may no she may not have given up her caviar and cocktails but she's getting a new body courtesy of they call it the shot the weight loss shots a good surgeon and a new man word from the curb is that she and lenny kravitz are dating but i'm telling you right now tommy b is not gonna last she's too high maintenance and he said as he worked out in those leather pants he only bathes once a month Ooh, the funk is getting me right now oh god but each of them clearly has a type but inquiring minds are wondering is this just a stunt to get attention because you know mariah is going back to vegas for a residency and lenny kravis and mariah are both up for induction into the rock and roll hall of fame mm, y'all can have that but anyway tyler perry we up with bet so you'll keep seeing all the queen's men sisters and all those other shows and netflix he said medea was gonna retire and go on to glory but that's not true because as long as she make a coin she gonna she gonna live on and on coming to netflix later on this year it's maria's maria maria's destination <laughs> vacation wedding you know maria is maria's evil twin so you know hey i heard it here first okay that's all i had to say about that now i want to tell you something we don't talk about dumb dumb did it but now chris jenner's purse holder aka her boyfriend Corey gamble is now being connected to diddy did he do it did he do it mm-hmm. why was Corey gamble in kim Porter's house when she died allegedly but explains now why the feds are looking for his mama bear chris jenner allegedly the feds found evidence of Corey gamble and chris jenner in puffy's house now did you hear the usher interview where <laughs> howard stern said would you send your kids to camp diddy and he said oh hell no and i don't blame him but puffy uh, about to start snitching because he said i'm not going down by myself and he got the freak off tapes and a whole bunch of other receipts so that's all i got ain't got no more it's your girl tanya b don't forget the bird wire on demand 24 7 at castropolis.net you have been served up your tea for this week <laughs> Thanks to Tanya B. Vi Tlaib, an author and political analyst, Harold Michael Harvey. Thanks to the crew. Millennial Nick, Lady J, Regia, Music by K-Dub, all those who help us make it happen every single week. Don't forget y'all subscribe, turn on your notifications so you can get new episodes as they come out. And with that, y'all, episode 221's in the can. Have a great week. Peace and power to the people. You've been listening to This is the G Podcast. This is the G Podcast is a production of the Castropolis Podcast Network. Thanks for listening.